Welcome back. We're at Lecture 40. Uh, my guess is that they'll probably be about somewhere in the low 60, 62 uh, class sessions in this particular course before all is said and done. So we're figure it out. I mean, it is a math class after all. We're two thirds of the way there, almost. Um, we have a test this week. We will cover um, Chapter 8, Section 3. It's got a couple of different uh, tests to see if something is uh, a series is convergent or divergent. So we're kind of continuing in that, and that reminds me that I forgot something today. I'm going to give you a chart, kind of a pecking order chart, that uh, if you're testing a series and you really don't have any clue what's going to work. Is it an alternating series, which we're not there yet? Uh, comparison test we're going to do today. Limit comparison test I think we'll get to today. Um, P-series maybe today, probably tomorrow. Uh, that test for divergence that we talked about last time, if the limit of the nth term does not approach zero, then we know for a fact that it diverges. So we're going to have a pretty long list of convergence and divergence tests. So I want to give you a chart. The chart has kind of a decision-making hierarchy on it. Um, I didn't make the chart. Uh, Marilyn McCollum, who is a math instructor in our department, made it. And uh, with her permission, we're going to continue to use it because it's very good. Uh, she recently retired. and. Um, spending more time at the beach. Doesn't that sound kind of pleasant? Mm. Let's just go. Let's close it up and go to the beach. Uh, so I will try to bring that tomorrow, and um, hopefully that will be helpful. It's not something you can use on a test, but I think it will kind of organize your thinking, help you organize your thinking for a test, that you'll try this. It takes a few seconds. If it works, it's good. If it doesn't, then Let's progress on to some of these other ones. Some of them take a long time. So you don't want to try them, for example, a ratio test, which we'll get at the end of uh, the chapter, near the end of the chapter. You don't want to, you know, kind of blindly try the ratio test and, oh, it didn't work. You know, we got a limit equal to one, therefore the test fails. Well, you've just wasted seven or eight minutes. So we want to save that one until we've ruled out some of the ones that take a matter of a few seconds. I think today we'll be able to get the integral test and the comparison test and possibly the limit comparison test. So we'll have three more uh, tests for convergence and divergence. Near the end of this section, um, probably tomorrow, possibly Wednesday, we'll uh, using some of these approximating techniques of a series that converges, we'll try to see how close our answer actually is. Or, if we wanted a certain level of accuracy, how many terms would we have to add together in order to get that level of accuracy? So do we add together 10 terms or 30 terms or 52 terms to get us you know, within one one millionth of the actual sum? All right, so 8.3, just kind of put a star beside the new tests as we come to them. And when you look back at your notes, you'll be able to pick off the kind of the different tests and, and the basics about how to do that. The integral test is, a, is one of the ones uh, lower in the hierarchy. So you can ask yourself the question, Basically, could I integrate that function and get a solution? If you can, then we're going to be able to make a, a decision. We'll do some of the examples. Uh, about half of the examples that I have are ones that are actually in the book because they're just really good ones, really classic ones, 1 over x, 1 over x squared, uh, and then we'll make those into kind of, since we already know something about them, we'll be able to use those because we know what those integrals do and consequently hopefully their series that goes along with them does the same thing. So we know there is a relationship between this s and this s. And we've seen when integrals converge and diverge, when you get an answer 
finite answer, it converges. And when you don't, you get something that does not exist and it diverges. So we've seen that. Uh, and we have seen the interaction between these two summation symbols. This is really for a finite number of things that we're adding together. And if we go to n and then let n go to infinity, that becomes an infinite number of things. And we then can switch. We've uh, the, probably the first tie that we saw between these two symbols was this one. That if we are adding the areas of skinny little rectangles together, the Riemann sum uh, concept, and we wanted there to be n rectangles, and we added their areas together, and then not just n, but we wanted to let the number of rectangles approach zero. That became, by definition, the value of the definite integral from a to b, whatever the starting value is, to whatever the ending value is. So we've already seen kind of how these things are related. We can't really get to an integral, let alone a definite integral, without this concept of adding together an infinite number of pieces, in this case skinny little rectangles, uh, to get the value of the definite integral. So what we want is a summation. That's what the answer that we really want, but we're going to use an integral to help us get that answer. So there's the series we're dealing with. It's an infinite series. Uh, it's not geometric because we're not multiplying by the same thing as we progress from one term to the next. Uh, but the terms are clearly positive, and they are decreasing. So it has a chance of converging. We, c we can't do this. We can't say that the limit of 1 over n, we could say it, but it'd be wrong. Uh, so we really probably shouldn't say it, that the limit of 1 over n squared as n approaches infinity is 0, therefore it converges. That's not going to work for us. Uh, it is true that the limit of 1 over n squared is 0, but that doesn't guarantee convergence. What's a good counterexample of what I just said? What's well, a series that does, the nth term does get closer and closer to 0, but it does not 1 over n or the harmonic series. So we've got a counterexample to that. So we can't just say that because the limit of the nth term goes to 0, therefore it's convergence. not going to work. What do you think about this one? Think it's getting small fast enough in order for this to converge? 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3. 1 over 4, that did not converge because the, although they got small, they didn't get small fast enough. What about this one? Most of you are saying that you think it's probably going to converge. Um, but we need to be able to prove that. So we're going to use the integral test. Let's see on a diagram where this series is, numerically, an actual picture of it on the diagram, see if we can use an integral to make the decision for us, and in general, can we use the value of a definite integral to help us decide on what's happening on the series. So let's take a look at we want the curve this is 1 over n squared, so we want the curve to be one over x squared. So let's see if we can find on this curve the values of this thing. One, one over one squared plus one over two squared and so on.
there's our first term. There's 1 over 1 squared. Isn't when I come up from 1 and the curve is 1 over x squared, the height of that curve is 1 over 1 squared, the width is 1, therefore the area of this is 1, and that happens to be the value of our first term. Now, the question is, can we continue that? Well, if I come up from 2, and if I'm on the curve 1 over y equals 1 over x squared, when x is 2, what is that height? <laughs> 1 over 2 squared, right? Because there's the curve. And 1 over 2 squared is the value of the second term of this series. Now, let's see if we can continue with that. Come up here to 3. How tall is that box? That is one unit wide, by the way. All these are going to be one unit wide. That would be one ninth. That's the value of the third term. And we could do the same thing. I don't know that I can actually do this. But we could continue this pattern on out to the right. That rectangle, its area would be what? One sixteenth, which is the value of the fourth term. So we can relate the curve. We don't really have the curve. We have these rectangles that are under the curve, but we can relate the curve to the, to the series that we had. What we really want is the sum of all these areas. This is a little problematic. The first one, 1, but as we mentioned last class or possibly the class before that, what happens initially in a series will never change what's going to happen eventually in that series. So why don't we start our discussion in our, let's kind of leave that first rectangle out there by, the, by its side, not include it in our discussion, but then let's restart the discussion on the right of that rectangle, knowing that whatever we get, we're going to get one added to it, this first rectangle. So I want to start at one and let this thing go to infinity. And I want to find the area under 1 over x squared. So the area under 1 over x squared is really all of this. Now, if we could determine that this converges to something, I don't know, let's say 5. 5 is not right. But let's say it converged to 5. And then we'd add 1 to it, so we say we want the 1 plus the area under this curve. If this converges, doesn't the sum of all these little boxes have to also converge? Does that make sense? So if the area under, I guess it didn't, or you wouldn't have given me that look. Uh, maybe that was a Monday morning look and not a, I, I don't understand that. So if we're able to find the area under this curve from 1 all the way out to infinity, doesn't it make sense that we're also going to be able to find the sum of the areas of these blocks? It's not even the same as the area under the curve, and we can find that because we're missing all these pieces, these little so-called little triangular pieces. So if this converges, then we're in business, the area in this particular series converges. It's even smaller than the area under the curve itself. So if this is small enough to converge, certainly anything smaller than that should converge. We're going to see that a couple times today with the uh, comparison test as well. Now, that doesn't mean that the sum of 1 fourth plus 1 ninth plus 1 sixteenth is exactly the same as the area under the curve. That's not what we're saying. We're just making a decision about convergence. That if we can find the area under the curve, certainly we can find the area of the boxes that are underneath this curve from 1 to infinity. So if the integral converges, so does the series that's associated with it. Well, let's see what happens to 1 over x squared.
Kind of looks like an improper integral to me. What do we do with an improper integral? Go limit um, as a goes to infinity of the integral under right. a. That's kind of save that so-called bad value, the infinity, to the end of the problem. So we'll go from 1 to a, we'll actually evaluate from 1 to a, and then the last step in the problem, we'll let a approach infinity. So that's x to the negative second. What's the integral of x to the negative second? Negative x to the negative 1. Good. Negative x to the negative 1. So that's the same thing as negative 1 over x. We'll evaluate that. from 1 to a, so we'll start off at a, negative 1 over a, minus negative 1 over 1. We like to see the negative 1 over a as a approaches infinity because what happens to negative 1 over a as a gets larger and larger and larger? Zero. This disappears, doesn't it? That goes to zero as a gets larger. And we're left with negative of negative 1, which is 1. So the area under 1 over x squared from 1 to infinity is 1. So let's go back to this one. We had this 1 out here by itself, which is this guy right here. We're going to add that in because that's the first term of the series. We just found that the area under this curve from 1 to infinity is also 1. Certainly if we can add this one block, this 1 by 1 block, to the entire area under the curve from 1 to infinity, we're going to be able to find the sum of these terms. Now it won't be 2, it'll be less than 2. Is that correct? If I add 1 plus 1 fourth plus 1 ninth, plus 1 16th all the way out to infinity. We're not going to get 2, but it's certainly bounded above by 2, so we're going to get something less than 2. In fact, it's about 1.65, roughly, if we could add that up. Again, that's an approximation, but certainly it's bounded above by 2. Therefore, by the integral test, because this integral converges from 1 to infinity, the series associated with it also converges. So how would you write that down? You would say that the integral converges. Therefore, And if you're asked to kind of check a block, what's the reason? The reason is the integral test. This is small enough to converge. Therefore, anything that finishes underneath of it, even if we're adding a finite number of terms to it, will also converge. Can we make a similar decision with something that we know diverges? In fact, this is another validation or verification that the harmonic series diverges. Just if you didn't happen to like the first version where we were grouping a certain amount of terms together, first term, second term, the next two terms, the next two, four terms, the next eight terms, if you didn't like that, that those kind of force this thing to diverge. Here's another validation for the harmonic series. We already know this diverges. Here's a good validation why it diverges. They're positive, they're decreasing, they're getting smaller, the nth term does approach zero, 
but just because the nth term approaches zero does not guarantee convergence. This is the classic counterexample. So we already know this diverges. Let's see if we can validate this another way and also have a picture that goes along with it. So if we wanted the integral that goes along with this particular series, what would the integral be? For 1 over n, it would be 1 over x. So there's our curve, 1 over x. It does kind of decrease asymptotically to the x-axis, just not quite as quickly as the one we looked at first today. So our first one is 1. So instead of coming back over here and drawing my 1 by 1 block, there's a method for that, or a reason for what I'm doing. I'm going to come over here to the right. That's one by one. So there's our first block. At two, we want one half. So there's that one. At three, we bring this guy over to here. That'd be one third at 4, we do the same thing. So we generate kind of the same process, but we don't have one over there to the left standing by itself. Again, we want to start our discussion right here at 1. We want to integrate, so we want the area under the curve from 1 to infinity. What's the integral of 1 over x? integrated with respect to x. Natural log. Natural log. Absolute value, but we don't have to pay attention to absolute value with this one because we're going from 1 to infinity. See if I can resurrect my saving of the bad value to the end of the problem. That's what it should look like. I'm not liking the natural log of A. I like it a whole lot better when the A is in the denominator. Then it can increase without bound, and that term disappears. I don't think we're going to get quite so lucky here. Natural log of 1 is 0. That's the power you'd raise e to get 1. So that disappears, so we don't need that anymore. So what happens to the natural log of a as a is allowed to increase without bound? Does it disappear? Natural log of 10, natural log of 100, natural log of a million, natural log of 600 trillion. Don't those values keep getting larger and larger? So we don't have anything disappearing, in fact, just the opposite. This limit does not exist, keeps getting larger and larger and larger. So we knew that. We've already done that earlier in, in this course, maybe even in 141, that we knew we couldn't get an answer to the area under 1 over x from 1 to infinity. Doesn't exist, therefore, the integral diverges. Well, if the integral diverges, look at our blocks here. Don't they go above the integral? Don't you think that this particular sum is in even worse shape than the area under the curve 1 over x from 1 to infinity? Not only does it have all the area that's under the curve, it's got some extra. The area under the curve is already in trouble when you add some extra. It's not going to help it. It's going to make it worse. 
we're already falling down with all this luggage on our backs. Well, let's add in some more. That's going to help things. Yeah, that's going to make it easier to carry, isn't it? No, that's going to make it worse. It's already in trouble. We add more to it, it is even worse in trouble. Yes? So if, um, if, if the curve were to be I think I know where you're going with if this. If it wasn't diverging, then if it wouldn't be conclusive. Okay, I'm not. Uh, let me let me see if I can get to the um, what I thought you were going to ask, and you tell me if you, if that's really what you just asked me. <laughs> so let's say we determined that this was convergent. Okay, am I headed down the right path here? And then we have this that is a little bit larger then something that's convergent, does that mean it also converges? It does not. It's got to be underneath the convergent. It's got to be above the divergent. If it's any mixture of that, we, we can't make a decision. So one way to look at that is this net is not that good. This net is not big enough to catch that particular situation. We'll have to get another net. Okay, and we do have some other nets that are a little bigger. So if it's bigger than the divergent, we're in business. If it's smaller than the convergent, we're in business. Any mixture of that, we cannot make a decision. We'll have to use another test. Is that what is that where you're headed? Okay. So what would we write down? Because this integral diverges. <coughs> Therefore, the series associated with that, because it actually goes above that curve. Sorry, that's not what I want. 1 over n. And again, Justification would be the integral test. <coughs> so what, did, what was true about both of these curves and what do we want to be true about any curve that has a chance of being decided by the integral test? We want it to be a positive terms. We want it to be each term to be positive. We'll deal with later what happens when they're alternating, but right now we want each term to be positive. We want it to be decreasing. If it's increasing, it doesn't have a chance of converging. And if we're going to be able to integrate it, it has to be a continuous curve. So when we convert it from the series to the integral, it's got to be a continuous curve. You can kind of flavor that just a little bit. It, technically, it doesn't have to be decreasing. Every term decreases from its predecessor, but it has to ultimately be decreasing. So you could have a few terms that got a little bit larger, a little bit larger, but then beyond some point, moving all the way out to the right, all the way to infinity, it does have to be decreasing, ultimately decreasing. Another thing that both of these did that doesn't have to be true, these both started at 1. They do not need to start at n equals 1. The nice thing about starting at n equals 1, and a couple of people have asked me about this in either office hours or email or after class, the nice thing about starting at 1 is when you put 1 in, it generates the first term. That's convenient. You put 2 in, it generates the second term. 3 generates the third term. That, that just, we like that. Visually, we like that, but that doesn't have to be true. You could take a series. Let's say 
an infinite geometric series, a r to the n minus 1. And if we started at 1, what's the first term? 1, r, 0. Not 0, a. but the power is 0, right? a r to the 0, a. which is just a. And the next term is a r to the 1 and a r squared. But we can write that another way. Let's say we want to start at n equals 0. Isn't that the same series? Well, put in 0, what do you get? a r to the 0, which is a. Put in 1, a r to the 1, which is a r, and so on. So you can kind of adjust and make them start wherever you want to. But this is probably the, the more convenient because 1 generates the first term. doesn't have to be the case. All right, so what do we have? We have um, kind of the harmonic series itself. We've now validated that two different ways that it diverges. You're not going to be asked to validate the harmonic anymore. I mean, we've said it's divergent two different ways, so we kind of use that. If the harmonic series diverges, let's say that we have This is the series in question. Is it permissible to take that three halves out in front? Sure. And we're going to encounter this a lot, so let's go ahead and decide now what we're going to do with this. If we have any number, any constant, any coefficient out here, times a series that we already know what it does, is that going to change what it does? No. no, it's not going to change convergence or divergence. It will change the value to which it converges, but it's not going to change our decision. So any constant times a converging is also converging. We don't have to make a big deal about that when we're trying to make a decision. Any constant times a, an existing divergent series is going to also diverge. So we can still call this harmonic. It is harmonic. It's three halves times our one that we traditionally call harmonic, but it is also a harmonic. All right, one of our uh, first ones that we'll kind of go through, we'll go through the kind of the test for divergence. That's quick and easy. We'll probably then see, ask ourselves, can I integrate this thing? If I can integrate it and get an answer, then I'll be able to use the integral test. The next thing is this P-series. So what does a P-series look like? It looks like this, 1 over n to the p. So for certain values of p, this is going to diverge. In fact, we already know one. We just did one. When p is 1, 1 over n to the 1 is just 1 over n, which is harmonic, which does what? Diverges. Uh, we already did another one today. Our first example, 1 over n squared. We decided that converged, right? 1 over n squared. Uh, if p is 0, that's not very interesting. 
if P is zero, that's just one added to itself. That one would diverge. Let, let's see if we can somehow categorize this. Let's leave this value out since we already know what it does. And let's say that um, P cannot be one for this particular discussion. So for all other values of P, how do we, and this is why we need the integral test first, because we're going to use the integral test to make the decisions on this P series. For P not equal to 1, this is 1 over n to the P is n to the, what, negative P? Um, I'm not liking that. I don't like working in terms of n's when we're integrating, so let's call this x to the negative p. So we're converting the function, the nth term description, into a function. So a sub n has to be convertible um, to some function. I don't think that's too big of a stretch to say the n's were the letters, the variables. We're now changing them to x's <coughs> so we can integrate with respect to x. <coughs> I'm going to rewrite that at the top of the sheet. So we're throwing out, we're throwing aside the natural log answer. So we know we cannot get a natural log answer. So if p is 1, this is x to the negative 1, which is 1 over x, which is the natural log. We're not dealing with that. We already know what happens when p is 1. We know it diverges. So how do you integrate x to the negative p if we throw out the possibility that it could be a natural log? It's a power series. What do you do typically when you integrate x to a power? What if it were x to the negative third? What would you do? Add one. Add one to the power, divide by the new power, right? Remember, the only case you can't do that is when the power is negative one. So we've already said it can't be negative one. So we get one added to the power divided by that new power. Let's go ahead and convert this so we save the bad value to the end of the problem. All right, we're supposed to put in the upper limit of integration. <coughs> x to the negative p plus 1. Sorry. So that replaces the x. And then we're supposed to put in 1. Why don't we factor out that denominator so we don't have to kind of think about that. So let's take that out in front. What is that numerator? One to any power we choose is going to be 1, right? Here's the one that we need to isolate on. And we need to decide for certain values of p, this term will disappear. We want it to disappear, right? What, what do we know causes this term as a approaches infinity? 
where do we want the A to ultimately end up? Zero. We want it to end up in the denominator, right? If we can somehow get that A to be in the denominator, I don't care what power it is in the denominator. If it's in the denominator and A approaches infinity, won't that term eventually disappear? So what value for P would send the A down to the denominator? P has to be more than 1. Everybody okay with that? If P is greater than 1, then we've got a negative exponent. That's what we want. We want the exponent to be negative. That sends the A to the denominator. Then if A approaches infinity and it's in the denominator, the value of that term disappears. So we want P to be greater than 1. So let's say P is greater than 1. When P is greater than 1, this term approaches 0. And whatever else is in the problem, don't we get an answer when this term disappears? So our decision would be what? Convergent? And if this term did not disappear, when would it not disappear? When P is... Right, there we go. That was my next question. Thank you for answering it before I asked it. We already know what happens when P is 1. It already diverges. Also, when P is less than 1, the A stays in the numerator. The exponent is positive, therefore the A stays in the numerator, and as A gets larger, that whole thing gets larger. We don't get a decision. Or, well, we do get a decision. It doesn't disappear like we want it to. <clears throat> so this means that it's going to converge. When the exponent is positive, the A stays in the numerator. As A gets larger, that term gets larger. Nothing is disappearing, so it diverges. So, P series. If P is greater than 1, we can automatically say, because we've already validated it right here, that that series is convergent. If P is 1 or less, we can go right to the conclusion that particular series is divergent. Here's an example of each. I uh, don't want the integral, sorry. That's not an example. Now we're not going to have one quite this dumb. Kind of got a dumb example here. 1 over n to the 1.4. It's going to be 3 halves or something else. But because we already know what to do with 1 over n to the p, which we classify now as a p series, we know if p is what? Greater than 1? It converges. And if p is less than or equal to 1, it diverges. Well, what does this do? Converges. So what do you write down? It's a p-series, and p is greater than 1. That'll do it. You might want to at least think about that as, instead of square root of n, n to a power. So that's 1 over n to the 1 half. Decision? Diverge. Diverges. It's a p-series. 
in what? P is less than or equal to 1? Those are pretty quick and easy. So you'll want to check those kind of right in that category with the integral test. Can I integrate it and get a solution? Then I'll use the integral test. Is it a P-series? It is. Okay, that's a quick decision as long as we justify that it is a P-series and what category P is in, we can get a quick and easy decision. Um, let me write this out and then we'll continue that thought until tomorrow. This is the beginning of a new test. Um, let's say that we're trying to kind of categorize this. Would this be a candidate for an integral test? Does that look like something that you would want to integrate? I can tell you it doesn't look like anything that I would want to integrate. So I would probably rule out the integral test pretty quickly in my hierarchy as far as I don't want to do that. Any guesses about this? Convergent, divergent? A 50-50 chance, right? How about this one? How about if the five were not there? You would say convergent. Why would you say convergent? It would be going faster than um, one to the wait. If you, um, because I mean, if it if it was just like one over, then never mind. Okay, you're size, right. The top side is going to be one, and the bottom is going to increase by by, by a factor of three. Yeah. Right. We, we do know what this is, so let's write a couple of them out. First one would be what? One-third? Second term is one-ninth, one-twenty-seventh. What kind of series is that? Geometric. Geometric. Don't we multiply by something as we go? What's the ratio? One-third. So there's our category. It's an infinite geometric series. What is, what, is, what is something else that we need to decide, help us decide if it converges or not? The ratio itself. We want the absolute value of the ratio to be less than 1. Well, is that true? Yes. So what Noah said is correct. It converges. And in fact, in this particular problem, we could say that it not only does it converge, we could find the value to which it converged, which would be what? First term over 1 minus the ratio. First term is 1 third. 1 minus the ratio is also 1 third. So 1 third over 2 thirds. If we could add all these terms together, what would we get? 1 half. So it is convergent. We actually, in this case, know the value to which it converges. Back to this problem. Does that help you decide? If the 5 is not there, it converges. What do you think it's going to do when the 5 is there in the denominator? Converges. It's also going to converge, and somebody said a nice word there, it converges even faster, right? Isn't it even smaller? So we'll talk about what this test is using something that we already know what it does and something that is close to that. We'll begin class with that test tomorrow.
So is it okay for me to say test tomorrow? <coughs> this test, this particular test, is tomorrow. <laughs>